Uh, thank you for coming out to uh, CSIS um, for our uh, latest in a series of uh, statesmen's forums, which we have occasionally to provide a platform for uh, leaders uh, in the international realm. Um, my name is Derek Mitchell. I'm the senior fellow uh, in the International Security Program here at CSIS, the director for the Asia Division, and also the director of the Southeast Asia Initiative, which we've been doing for about uh, a little over a year now uh, here at CSIS. Uh, I want to first make a few thank yous for those who have uh, organized and helped put this all together. First, the external relations folks, Russ Oates and team and such all in the back there who, who make this all happen uh, rapidly and efficiently. I want to thank them as usual for their excellent efforts. And my team, uh, Lee Ridley and Brian Harding. Uh, I also want to note the presence of uh, ambas our ambassador to, to East Timor, Ambassador uh, uh, Clem. Uh, welcome and thank you for, for joining us today. Um, on behalf of John Hamry, the President and uh, CEO here at CSIS, it is my pleasure and indeed my honor to uh, welcome President uh, Jose Ramos Horta to CSIS. Um, it is really an honor for me. I don't know uh, if you all know, but before I did security work, I did democracy work uh, in the mid-90s at, at the National Democratic Institute. And uh, one of the great pleasures of my working there was to meet the real heroes, the people that were courageous, um, Commit, uh, people who are committed to democracy and human rights at the grassroots level who are making a difference in very, very difficult, very challenging environments. Uh, it's something that was rewarding and that was tremendous honor for me to be part of in a small way in the 90s. So it is always wonderful to be able to host um, people like uh, uh, the current president uh, here at CSIS, uh, someone that I heard a lot about but only met just today. So hopefully we can keep in touch uh, in the future. Um, it is, um, uh, East Timor is an issue that has fallen off the radar screen to some degree, and it, it happens sometimes it becomes a cause celeb in the international society, a democracy issue, a human rights issue. Then there is, quote, achievement of that goal of independence or a uh, democratic transition, and then people say, yes, great, we're done, we move on to the next issue. Um, I think um, there's a lot to be done, and I think we, we need to be paying attention to the newest um, uh, country of, of uh, Southeast Asia. And that's why I'm particularly glad that uh, President Ramos Horta is here today. And it is particularly great that he is committing, uh, committing himself to his people um, uh, by uh, continuing, continuing his uh, work for East Timor. I think all of you know his background. He spent 24 years in exile, uh, a lot of time in Washington. When he comes back here, he has uh, a lot of friends on the Hill and around town that have known him for years and years. Uh, the other great thing of being in Washington, I've been in Washington now 22 years, basically, off and on. Uh, you see folks come through in the opposition, and then over time they become the leaders of their country. So um, it is actually a, something to understand here. When you meet people that seem, oh, well, they're just a, a marginalized figure or just, a, just an advocate, you never know where they may rise to. It can become presidents, and we've seen all throughout the 90s. Uh, uh, all these committed, courageous people become presidents and prime ministers. Um, after he achieved, uh, East Timor achieved independence in 2002, he became the foreign minister of his country and then prime minister in 2007. And then in May of 2007, he became president. And I actually was doing, just looking at the, the history here, it was exactly two years ago today that you announced your candidacy for president in East Timor, and here you stand, uh, sit with us. And of course, a year ago, as you may have seen in the headlines, there was uh, an attempt on his life. And we are, as I talked to him right before this, he is in good health now. He is uh, feeling much better. I think there is some residue of it. But uh, we are tremendously uh, grateful for uh, his return to health and also uh, in admiration for his continued commitment to his country. He's gone through much and continues to provide much uh, to his people. And I think we in the United States need to be more aware of this. So today we give him a platform to talk about the issues of East Timor, the contributions the United States might make to that and to remind us of the great commitment of him uh, as an individual. So with that, please join me in welcoming President Jose Ramos. Uh, good morning. Thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, very prestigious institution. I have not uh, prepared anything uh, in writing, uh, so bear with me my uh, uh, random thoughts uh, 
reflections, uh, report on the situation in uh, uh, my country. I uh, came to uh, New York last week to address the Security Council uh, February uh, 19 as they consider uh, to extend for another year the current United Nations mission to Timor-Leste, UNMIT. I rarely have uh, found the Security Council in, ma in such a positive mood and uh, with unanimity in regard to a particular country uh, situation. Yesterday, I visited Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and uh, House Speaker uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi. Probably yesterday was one of the best days for these two powerful uh, ladies, in the sense that finally someone came to them with good news about the wall. <laughs> and uh, in the midst of extraordinary problems, challenges facing the international community, in particular the new administration, I believe for them yesterday was a pause in the uh, long list of bad news. Economic financial crisis in the U.S. that is spilled to the rest of the world, ongoing uh, problems that you know of uh, from uh, Afghanistan to uh, elsewhere in, in Africa, uh, Sudan, uh, but also in our own uh, uh, region besides Afghanistan. Uh, in, uh, very serious uh, challenges uh, in Pakistan, uh, North uh, Korea. Uh, so, uh, East Timor reemerged after the 2006 uh, crisis as a small oasis of tranquility and economic uh, growth. I went to the Security Council in May 2006, immediately after the beginning of the crisis in my country. I flew out, went to the Security Council, addressed them, if I'm not mistaken, May 4 or May 5, 2006. I said at the time, uh, appealing to the Security Council to uh, adopt some uh, more f robust, forceful uh, action on East Timor uh, in terms of peace enforcement if necessary. I said at the time, Dili was a city on the edge, fear was palpable. But the Security Council being what it is, uh, heard, debate, and took no action. This is not a criticism of Security Council, or, of, or least of all of that great man, uh, Kofi Annan, the, the then Secretary General, but it is the reality of uh, the United Nations in that uh, a lot of factors uh, have to be considered. And then even when there is political will, and there was political will uh, in the Security Council to do something, it, it never happened that a decision is made uh, on the spot, and once the decision is made, it follows through with uh, execution, and that means the deployment of whatever uh, uh, they had agreed. So what the Security Council did was to uh, roll over uh, un, uh, un, UNOTIL for another month. Then end of June, another month. July, another month while everybody Security Council, very religious people, each and every one of them, prayed to God that things would improve on the ground. So that Security Council would not have to uh, actually do anything beyond that. Unfortunately, by August situation, uh, by June, July, situation deteriorated. And only by end of August, the Security Council authorized a new mission called UNMIT, with a robust police force, but without a peacekeeping force, particularly without a extraction capability, which particularly after uh, the events in Baghdad, 
was very much a requirement of the Secretary General that whenever the UN has to send a mission, it has to go with a robust force for its own protection. In view of that impossibility of getting uh, the Security Council to agree to a peacekeeping force with robust uh, force, with airborne extraction capabilities, and as the situation deteriorated towards the end of uh, May, I met with my leaders, the President, Sharan Guzman, Prime Minister al Khatiri, and uh, General Tau Matarua, Commander of Defense Force, Minister of Interior. I even went to uh, consult spiritually with the Bishop of Dili to see whether we should swallow our pride and ask for bilateral international assistance. The situation, as the situation deteriorated, we swallowed our pride and uh, we decided to ask for direct assistance from uh, Portugal, Australia, New Zealand and Malaysia. Four countries that we picked very carefully, very considerably, and who responded promptly and within a matter of uh, days, they deployed their forces into Timor-Leste. Note that uh, we were in doubt whether with our own resources, we would be able to uh, prevent further escalation of the violence. Maybe we could have, but we just didn't want to take chance, risk, uh, and uh, then sacrificing, victimizing more people. That's why I said, no, we swallow our pride and we ask for friends to help. And they came, uh, Portugal from very far away, 20,000 miles away, politically responded promptly and within a matter of days. Its uh, best police unit, the GNR, which was in uh, Baghdad, uh, also the only uh, foreign force in Baghdad that uh, never suffered a single casualty with, uh, apart from wounded, and they did remarkable work in Iraq. Uh, protecting everybody else, rescuing others when they came under ambush and so on. So it was this special unit uh, that was sent to Timor, an extraordinary uh, display of uh, uh, mobility. Within days, they were there on the ground with full gear, F followed by Malaysia. Malaysia was also uh, outstand outstanding in that a developing country managed to deploy troops uh, thousands of miles away, uh, and uh, very expeditiously and efficiently. Australia and New Zealand also responded uh, generously and uh, quickly. But then once they are on the ground, is when we start considering all the legal ramifications and command and control who were to be in charge and so on. So we had bilateral agreements with all these four countries but then when the UN adopted UMIT with a, a multi, with a police force, Portugal and Malaysia transitioned over to the UN, but then Port Australia and New Zealand preferred to remain outside the UN command, so we had to negotiate a trilateral uh, agreement, Timor-Leste with Australia and New Zealand and the UN, a unique uh, arrangement uh, that uh, established the rules uh, on the ground, and the chain of command, uh, respect for the sovereignty, authority of the East Timor side. I have to say, the experience has been a most successful one, both on the political side, but also operational on the ground. Even though these forces never cooperated before in the past in any theater uh, in Timor, they managed to uh, uh, work well efficiently. But that's not all. We had to uh, also work politically, myself and others, to do our part of our responsibility in uh, resolving the crisis. By the time I came back uh, last week, two years later, I came back addressing the Security Council in a totally different uh, atmosphere in my country. 2008 our economy grew at 10.5%. In 2007, 
just one year after crisis, it grew at 8%. This real GDP growth, non-oil uh, growth, it doesn't factor in the revenues from uh, oil. Uh, the growth comes from investments in infra infrastructures, um, uh, increased investments in agriculture sector, and uh, so on and so on. The <coughs> political situation uh, more stable than uh, ever. These are five-party coalition, of which four are in government. The fifth party is not in the government, but support the coalition. Remarkable that uh, a year and a half after the formation of the government, the government is still in place. As you know, uh, coalitions are not easy to manage. In Israel, in Italy, these are not really great examples but, uh, of <laughs> political stability, but what comes to mind. Uh, and, uh, and if they don't work very well in Israel or Italy, well, less in East Timor. So I, I personally was surprised that uh, the government has lasted this long. And if that's so, is a tribute to Prime Minister Shanana Guzman's leadership, uh, and probably he, only him in the group of the current group that uh, is in the government, uh, able to manage this uh, coalition with his charisma, his charm, his patience, and uh, <coughs> managing the transition from 2007, when the government was uh, empowered by me, August 2000, having to deal, resolve the problems of IDPs. We had over 150,000 refugees in 2006, 2007. Today, most of the camps are closed, maybe two uh, remaining. I'm not so up to date uh, now, but uh, by the time I left the country, there were two or three to be closed. Uh, the so-called petitioners, uh, soldiers' problems, they all went home after receiving a generous uh, package of assistance from the government, a package that I myself had initiated, negotiated when I was uh, prime minister. The, some of the real problems that we, uh, some of the root problems uh, that brought about the crisis in 2006 are being resolved, not completely, and that is reform of the security sector, police and army. In 2006, these two institutions had the lowest uh, possible uh, popularity rating. If a survey were to be con conducted at that time about how people's perceptions, trust in our police force, probably to be zero. And the same would, would be with our army. Uh, the latest survey conducted by International Republican Institute, released only a week, two weeks ago, our uh, police uh, popularity came uh, second with 80 percent uh, approval rate, the army 78 percent, the government uh, uh, 65 percent approval rating or more. I'm not so sure of the exact figure. The prime minister even higher, his personal leadership. Uh, so overall, the mood in the country uh, changed. While a year, two years ago, if you would ask the people what is their main concern, number one would be security. Today, security came very last in their concern. Number one is education. More and more education is what the people are asking. And that's what uh, the government is also trying to do since last year's budget, this year's budget, to provide more opportunities to young East Timorese to study in our own country, improving the existing institutions, but also sending people abroad. To Australia, unfortunately, still very few uh, scholarships provided by Australia, only 20 scholarships. New Zealand, 10. Uh, Cuba, one of the poorest countries in the world, as you probably know, most of you Americans probably are familiar with Cuba, <laughs> uh, provide 800 scholarships to East Timorese medical students, almost 100 percent covered by the Cubans, plus uh, 150 uh, Timorese uh, study medicine in Timor under Cuban uh, guidance. Of course, I, it would be, I would be totally unfair if I were not to haste to add that uh, obviously 
even though Australia provides only 20 scholarships, or New Zealand provides 10 scholarships and so on, that's not the total amount of their aid. You know, the commitment by Australia to Timor in terms of overall uh, developing assistance, something like $70 million US this year, on top of their own uh, cost in covering the deployment of their troops in Timor. That would run to hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, New Zealand in particular, you know, such a small country, uh, 4 million people, their commitment to Timor, but since 2000, since 99, has been just exemplary. Uh, at one time or another, 40% of New Zealand forces were tied down with Timor uh, way back in 1999-2000. And today they remain uh, part of the so-called International Civilization Force in Timor. So I want to add this so that uh, uh, it's set in the proper uh, context. We have been very much praised uh, in, by our uh, by donors, by friends, in the way we manage our petroleum uh, fund. We have a very modest income from uh, uh, oil and gas, particularly just from one field called Bayou Undan, which we negotiated, agreed with Australia way back in uh, 2002. Luckily for us, the moment the country became independent, we, entered, we signed an agreement with Australia, not 100% to our satisfaction, but that's how things happen in life. The Australians were not also 100% satis satisfied because they wanted it all for them, and we wanted it all for us. <laughs> in the end, we got 90% of the upstream um, uh, revenues, and Australia 10%. The pipeline is uh, in Darwin. So, uh, But I think Australians were very fair, and... Uh, uh, in the dealing with us at the time. Uh, and it is these that provide us with this breeding uh, space and uh, this money that enable us to be 100% self-sufficient in financing our budget. We were advised back then by Norway, but also the World Bank and IMF in developing our petroleum fund uh, that today is viewed as the best in the world. We take pride that some countries are coming to study the Timorese experience. Of course, we are very quick in uh, claiming credit, as if we were the ones who actually invented this system without giving due credit to the Norwegians, to the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, <clears throat> the role of the World Bank and IMF in Timor-Leste have been uh, exemplary, you know, in the past, uh, uh, from, from day one. If today we have a very solid financial system, it's thanks to these two uh, multilateral institutions. And uh, critical uh, that current leadership of the World Bank, uh, Mr. President Zolik, is uh, refocusing World Bank attention on rural development, poverty <coughs> alleviation, uh, all of us, uh, donors and recipient countries, have a failed in the last 20 years to anticipate the food crisis. And if we look at the statistics, the data, it shows that 10 years, 20 years ago, 18% of overall uh, international uh, ODA went to agriculture. By 2006, it's less than 3%. Whose responsibility? Of course, the receiving countries, we always blame the donors, you know, as if uh, the donors come in and say, sorry, you are not going to work on agriculture. We are going to give you money to buy cars. Well, it doesn't happen like that. So the receiving countries have also a responsibility in this regard. On our side, seizing on the food crisis, the government woke up and starting last year, began serious investments in the agricultural sector to ensure food security. Uh, U.S. aid to Timor-Leste, uh, which is very generous and stable for the last many years, uh, averaged between 20 to 25 million dollars, excluding uh, many other assistance, like visits of uh, Navy ships, like Mercy ship, that cost millions uh, daily that, uh, when they are there on the ground and other visitors uh, from the U.S. Uh, Defense Forces. Uh, 
Uh, apart from that, the U.S. Uh, assistance, about 70 percent of it, goes to rural development and introduce some of the best agricultural experiment uh, right now going on that in the areas that they have experimented it, it triple the income of the people in the area. And I hope that we can replicate it around uh, the country. It could really make a huge difference. So thanks to this international partnership from the World Bank, uh, IMF, donor community, uh, the United Nations, that today we can say, when I speak before you today here, and last week in the UN, we brought, I'm bringing good news. But the good news should not be reason for us to be over op op optimistic and complacent. Because we were optimistic before, for many years addressing my, our national parliament the media, I always caution our people. Peace is a reality in my country, but still fragile. And when you deal with a fragile situation, you have to be extremely prudent. Prudent in the way we talk, measure our very word. Prudent in the way political leaders deal with each other prudent in the way institutions of sovereignty deal with each other, to mutual support, and prudent in the way the international community should deal with the countries in transition like uh, East Timor, in that any hasty withdrawal for whatever reasons can lead to what happened in my country in 2006. But whose responsibility? It's not only the UN, it's ourselves also. I recall how many of my compatriot leaders today found that even that uh, two-year term of the UN in Timor was too long. They were so anxious, so super patriotic, that two years of UN presence was almost like equivalent to uh, another colonial settlement. And, uh, and when ourselves, we want the UN to live sooner, well, the UN is very happy to oblige. There are many other problems around the world. <laughs> so, uh, but also some in the UN, they have a certain mentality, thinking that uh, most important when you deal with a, a mission, you have to consider uh, costs of it, rather than what exactly is the problem, how to address it, how to resolve it, how long does it take, and then you do the calculation. But that doesn't happen like that, and that's understandable. It's easy for me uh, to lecture or U.S. or others because I'm not paying for the peacekeeping missions. It's the U.S. that pays for it. So uh, it's easy to say that the U.S. always worry about to the cost. The French always worry about the cost. Well, yes, uh, they are the ones who are paying for it. That's the reality. But being what being it is, my advice, as I told the Security Council two years ago, a year ago as Prime Minister, I asked them uh, whether anyone in the Security Council have a thought how long would it take, does it take normally for uh, a small business like a takeaway little business restaurant in Washington DC or New York to uh, be effective, sustainable, man, you know, turning a profit. Not that I was ever involved in any takeaway business at the time I was in New York, but uh, familiar with it, it takes three, five years from the moment you set up the business, the investment, and they start having clients, people start trusting your food, your uh, guys who deliver the food in bicycles to around Manhattan without being knocked by a yellow taxi, and all of that. So it takes three, five years or more. Well, then I ask you, the council members, and your excellencies think that you can build a nation state in two years? Well, that's what they wanted to do in 1999-2000. Uh, Sergio Vieira de Mello, you have two years to build from ashes this non-existent entity into a modern function democratic state and leave by 2002. Well, uh, don't do that in regard to East Timor or to Sierra Leone 
or to any other country, because it is not only a question of building the physical institutions, the constitution, the legal uh, uh, edifice that goes with a modern uh, state, it, but also there's a problem that is take much longer to resolve, and that is the, the wounds of the soul, of the heart, of the mind. After generations of humiliation, of suffering, the most complicated in any conflict situation, in my personal experience, in my country, and few others that I observe, is the individuals, the society, the communities. When I took over, to end, uh, to, uh, when I took over as a defense minister, uh, I, was, I was foreign minister, then in uh, some time, end of May, uh, early June 2006, I was asked to serve as defense minister because the then defense minister had to resign. Uh, my first reaction was of utter embarrassment. I never saw myself as a potential defense minister, knowing very little about uh, uh, this field, but I accepted. A few weeks later, I was asked to serve also as prime minister because the then prime minister had to resign. I went to the parliament and I explained to the country, I do not see my role as a commander-in-chief, defense minister in a typical fashion. I'm not going to buy more weapons. I see myself more as a chaplain of the army, the priest of the army. Well, not that I was exactly uh, the most qualified to be a priest, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, they understood what I meant, and that is I will care first about the soul, the wounds of the soldiers, the police. Heal the wounds within the police institution, within the army, between the two institutions, and between them and the country. And that's what I set out to do in the following months, looking after the individuals. And it was this silent work of every day, going to the soldiers and the police, talk to them, pep talk sometimes to small groups, to larger groups, sometimes using very harsh language with them, but other times looking after their daily needs, from uniforms to better pay, to certain symbols, and uh, maybe I contributed in some ways to today this high popularity rating of our police, which is 80%. Only a week ago, in New Zealand, on the way here, I was asked by one of the New Zealand uh, senior police officers in the New Zealand Police Academy in Auckland what I thought of uh, our people's uh, perception of our police. My answer very frank, I say, well, I think still very negative. Well, I was surprised when a few days later I got the opinion poll from IRI. 80% popularity rating. The first uh, most popular person in the country is the Pope himself. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, well, the most popular person in my country actually is Barack Obama, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I went to a, a village a few months ago in Laga. Laga is the poorest village. There where I launched my campaign for presidency, symbolically because uh, I always defined myself as president of the poor. And I tried to do my very best for the poorest of the poor of this my country and of this planet. And I visited that village many times over the years, and I went there again a few months ago, before the election time. And I asked the kids there, seven, eight years old, 11, 12, uh, from different parts of the region, where they were following the American elections. They said yes, very enthusiastically. And I asked who you are going to vote for. I told them there are two candidates. They didn't wait for me to finish. They said, Obama. So, uh, President Obama got 100% of the votes in Lager. <laughs> I got only 70%. <laughs> so, he's more popular uh, uh, than me. That's where we are today. But before I, uh, I end, I conclude my remarks, something on what the U.S. can do. 
your country, for those who are Americans, I know not everybody is American here in this room, today is a unique situation to really mobilize international goodwill, hardness, goodwill and resources into addressing some of the great challenges that you face and all of us face. I do not recall when in history there has been such an inspiring uh, president, maybe only comparable to John F. Kennedy, whose name, uh, the Kennedy's name, still today linger in some of remote, remotest villages in my, in my own country. But back then, John Kennedy didn't have yet all the uh, tools of modern communication, from television to the Blackberry. Uh, today, President Barack Obama has this means of communication and mobilization of people. A few years ago, I gave a series of lectures in Southeast Asia, particularly in Thailand, that later became chapter of a book. The title was uh, Challenge of the 20th Century, Can the U.S. Lead? In that chapter, I try to present a more neutral or sober uh, assessment of the uh, United States. Following September 11, the interventions in uh, Afghanistan and then Iraq, because of the policies of the administration, the administration and the United States were demonized in the eyes of everybody. It is at that time that I try to uh, offer my uh, audience in Asia a more sober uh, assessment of the real role of the uh, United States. And my answer was yes, it can lead. It can lead through inspiration. It can lead through building international consensus to address some of the great challenges that we all face. Leadership is the ability to persuade and to bring people around you, side by side, behind you to address. And the United States today is in this such a great uh, situation. What can it really do, uh, referring specifically only to our immediate region? In regard to Indonesia, I'm very pleased that uh, Secretary of State Clinton uh, went to Indonesia. Following the events of 99, when Indonesia walked out of Timor-Leste, we ourselves, those who were on different trenches in, of the firing line, both in the field and the diplomatic firing line, Indonesia and East Timor decided to normalize relations. Within a matter of days, I personally visit Indonesia, and uh, since then, countless times, Current Prime Minister Shanana Guzman was also one of the chief architects of the normalization of relations with Indonesia. Today, people to people, government to government relations are exemplary. Each side walks halfway to embrace the other. Our border, for instance, is the safest of any border in the world, safer than a, in the rest of our own country when the crisis was worse in 2006. Sometimes I used to say the Indonesian military actually does the security for us because our own police on our side of the border, mostly relaxed, casual, no uh, uh, logistic means support from our own side. If it were not for Indonesian military, that area would be very active uh, area in all kinds of illicit trade, which still goes on. but. Uh, I even tell our police not to worry too much about the normal uh, poor illicit trade going on. When one of our policemen proudly told me one day that he confiscated 90 liters of fuel that someone smuggled from West Timor to East Timor, deep down I thought, poor guy, the guy who bought the fuel, how now he's going to pay back to the... I say, is it really such a big problem? Is really, this is the problem you have. <laughs> and I talked to Foreign Minister uh, Hassan Ureyuda that we governments should not be an obstacle to poor people trading with each other. So how about developing a free trade zone between Timor-Leste and the eastern Indonesian islands? 
because whether we regulate or not anyway, they are doing bustling trade going on right under our nose. And literally, near my house, every morning I drive past, I see two or three Indonesian wooden boats unloading illicit cargo from Indonesia. I wave to them, they wave to me as <laughs> I go by. They probably say, Bagus President Ramos Horta. <laughs> because I would never call the police or the immigration and to hassle these poor people who are surviving. But we have to further strengthen the relations by creating a regulated border market, which we are doing, issuing travel uh, equivalent to passports so the people in the border can travel back and forth without requirement of visa. So these are what uh, this exemplary relation we have. I would urge the United States, particularly with the visit of Secretary Clinton, that I'm very, very pleased that the United States uh, finally is more actively, proactively re-engaged with Indonesia. And that means across the board. And that means lift every restriction you have had till today, uh, including on the Indonesian military. You want to further assist them in consolidation of their democracy. You want to help us help Indonesia as well to further stabilize. Peace and stability in East Timor depends very much also on a prosperous Indonesia, an Indonesia that uh, has shown in an extraordinary, remarkable way uh, that it was able to swallow its own wounded pride of the past because when it, was, it had to walk out of Timor-Leste, it did not walk out defeated. We did not defeat the Indonesian militarily. They walked out because circumstances changed in Indonesia, because they had a pragmatic president, uh, B.J. Habibi, at least 20 years living in Germany, taught him to be pragmatic. He thought Timur was a waste. I remember I was in, in January 98 in Atlanta at CNN with many good friends there. I spent the whole day at CNN headquarters giving every sort of interview I wanted in every possible language. And I heard an interview by B.J. Habibi. He said, by December, I want Indonesia out of Timur. That place has only rocks. <laughs> That's how he put it. Actually, sometimes when I travel in my own country, I tell to my people, I think actually Habibi is right. He's so <laughs> Many rocks everywhere in this country, which the students use, you know, whenever they fight each other. <laughs> and uh, Indonesia changed dramatically. And if you want to help us, help Indonesia as well. Lift all the restrictions you have uh, on them. It is uh, two countries, in my view, Turkey and Indonesia, are the best examples of how democracy Islam go hand in hand. They are mutually translatable. You support these two countries to further progress. You want the battle of ideas against the extremists in these same countries that want to undermine uh, modernity, uh, democracy, peace, and stability. I thank you. God bless you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, we do have time, about a half hour for questions. And what I'd ask, we have uh, microphone runners that, that will get to you, wait till they get to you once I've, uh, I've pointed at you, and uh, introduce yourself and your affiliation. So we'll I'll start with Chris. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll stand over here so I, I can see, I'm sorry. My name is Chris Nelson, and actually uh, I was the congressional delegation was in East Timor in 1979, and if you had asked me to bet that I would see you standing here today, I wouldn't have. Uh, it's a real privilege to hear you, sir. Um, you, you mentioned uh, 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 Secretary Clinton's visit to the neighborhood, and you offered some very pragmatic advice. So my question is, is uh, based on what you heard her say, what you think you heard her say about the need to develop a new approach on Burma, uh, not just the United States approach hasn't worked, but neither has the ASEAN or Japanese approach. Um, do, you, uh, do you have some advice for the United States on how, how we should perhaps rethink what we're doing with Burma? And this, sort of the subsidiary question on that is uh, when she got to China, she made rem some remarks that 
some of our friends in the in the human rights community have have seen uh, in not the most favorable light about, about uh, in a sense larger issues uh, you know the world environment the world economy uh, we've got to take that in perspective so uh, in a sense a two part question but mainly what's your advice to us on how to rethink the Burma situation thank you well I would hesitate to say I advise because uh, you know people in the State Department White House in administration have uh, decades of experience in dealing with Asia they probably have attempted you know every possible uh, uh, strategy, but uh, I can uh, uh, maybe restate uh, what I've said many times, particularly starting in 2001. When uh, in 2001, before Timor independence, but we were in the last uh, month towards independence, I heard the news that the military in Burma released Suu Kyi. I see a press statement urging the international community to immediately seize on that a step in. It did not. A few months later, there was a setback. Suu Kyi was alone in that road, all alone, sitting in the car. Nothing illustrates better the failure of disengaging from Burma. In my own experience over the years, the moment I seize an opportunity, the slightest opening of the door, I put my foot in and squeeze myself further in and in until I'm right inside the game. From there you play. And uh, uh, so sanctions, I don't disagree with sanctions uh, for, for the sake of it, you know, uh, that I don't, I don't agree. You know, I th when you look at situation in Myanmar, as I look at situation in Cuba, a few times I went there. Uh, when you punish a regime or punish a country for the perceived sins of the regime, and I use the word perceived because I'm not here to judge uh, how the US or any country perceive other countries. So it's because of perceived, perceived sins of, of the regime, the consequence is that you hurt also the collateral damage is the people. In the case of Burma, whenever, when sanctions are applied and certain Western companies have to pull out, thousands of people go into unemployment, and not only, or they find other means. So some other companies with less uh, uh, sensitivity less concern about laws and regulations, less concern about public opinion <laughs> uh, and civil society, they take over. And uh, the, the, some of the little oases of freedom, of respect for labor rights and human rights in those factories that originally was owned by an American company that is scrutinized by US laws uh, or whatever, taken over by someone else, well, maybe by the military. So it is nonsense, you know, sanctions have to be smart. If you want to fight for something, fight in a smart way, not in a dogmatic uh, uh, way. I know that the military in Burma are desperate for change. They want changes. And this is a unique opportunity. Uh, for the U.S. to engage them. But I hope also that the military don't read it, that because they hear uh, you know, more, I would say, uh, the positive statements coming from Secretary of State Clinton, President Barack Obama, that they think that, well, now we can get away with everything. I think the administration is giving them maybe a wind of opportunity, giving them one year, to start changing. And I think this is the right uh, approach. I believe the situation in Burma is not an intractable one. If you ask me, can it be resolved? I would say yes, if I'm hopeful about a particular situation in, among the current problems around the world, Burma is one of the easiest. You have a established entrenched military, at least you know who you're dealing with, who you have to work with. 
you work with one particular group, the military. Then you have a very well-established figure, Do Aung San Suu Kyi. Is it so difficult to bring Tan Sui and Suu Kyi to talk face to face as a first step? Yeah, no. So I think it's, uh, I'm optimistic about that. Uh, as long as uh, the U.S. really stays engaged. Because in the past, I told uh, the U.S. side, if you want the Chinese to take you seriously on Burma, don't put Burma as one of the 100 agenda items that you will talk after the end of the conversation. Do you want the Chinese to take you seriously, to work with you in partnership to resolve the problems of Burma? not the Chinese see their sacred mission in life to promote democracy, that's not their point. But for China, they obsess with stability, with security. A Burma that is unstable is not good for them. A Burma that is totally ostracized by the world is not good for them. As China also wants to be a responsible member of the international community, and they have been doing their very best in this regard, what well, they want is also for their closest neighbors and Burma. So you can work with the Chinese. But the President of the United States has to talk consistently with Wu Jintao on this issue. Or the Secretary of State Clinton to talk with his, her counterpart. To make it like, you know, just you know, one agenda item uh, as part of many other issues, well, it doesn't work. Then because the, the Chinese can read. You know, they can read your, uh, uh, how serious you are with an, an issue. Sam Mancock of uh, Emerald Planet, you have a thank you for being here today, Mr. President, and you have a very uh, solid wisdom on how to deal with uh, many touchy issues. What other suggestions or ideas would you like to share about the new emphasis on smart power and relationship with countries such as uh, Timor and others around the globe? <coughs> Again, you know, without pretense to, uh, you know, lecturing uh, the U.S., particularly uh, in this institution, you know, the brightest uh, here in this uh, center, uh, who am I to come and uh, uh, pretend to offer new uh, ideas? I, uh, I hope that uh, in the next few days I'm able to complete a small uh, essay. Uh, I think I promised uh, to, to you, I think. Uh, so, <laughs> for a newsletter. Newsletter for newsletter. <laughs> and uh, I hope for a, uh, a two grand uh, title, uh, New Partnerships, U.S. and New Partnerships. I sincerely believe that uh, that so-called G7, G8 model is as old as the permanent five of the Security Council. To... Uh, President Barack Obama, again, is in a unique situation to encourage his colleagues in the G7 to move beyond G7 to accommodate the following emerging powers, India, China, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, because whether you like it or not, they still control the vastest oil reserves in the world. And in spite of all the talks about non-renewable source of energy, this will be the case before you can declare the age of fossil fuels finished. So uh, for many decades to come, Saudi Arabia will be the, probably still the single most important source of oil, plus Brazil, South Africa. These are the people you have to work to mobilize resources, the best mind on how to uh, address some of the uh, economic financial problems, but also some of the security and uh, political problems. Expand uh, the Security Council to uh, increase the numbers of uh, permanent members. Uh, the process started in 2005 with Kofi Annan, bogged down. Uh, but uh, realistically, I would say that uh, the following countries qualify. In Latin America, Brazil. I know that Argentina is not totally uh, in agreement with that, but uh, 
Brazil is the indisputable uh, larger power in Latin America. And uh, it is a fascinating country in the sense of uh, uh, if you want to uh, have a, a model, an example of uh, a crossroad of civilizations, of cultures, of history, it's Brazil. And, uh, and under President Lula, Brazil has really finally uh, uh, taken off. And uh, then in Africa, you cannot uh, turn around, but uh, no way, uh, other way, but work with South Africa and Egypt. These are the two. Uh, and uh, Asia, India, and Indonesia have to be brought in, but besides Japan, and it is everybody agree. Uh, but plus India and, and Indonesia. I, I'm proud that I was the first speaker in the UN General Assembly many years ago to argue for Indonesia to be included as one of potential permanent members. It is 240 million people, but also because it is the largest Muslim country in the world, and because when you look at the current composition of the Security Council, and if and if you include some of the new potential members for permanent membership, the imbalance in the Security Council in terms of how many Christian nations are there represented, how Christianity is represented, and how Islam is represented, is huge imbalance. And Asia is overly underrepresented. Asia region, which contains half of the world population, is the least represented in the UN system. So there has to be cor this has to be corrected to accommodate this uh, giant of region, which is Asia. So that's, I think, President Barack Obama can do that. And I'm not saying this is not only political. This is a new power balance in the world that can really help solving many of the problems uh, we face today. That has, if you go back, has to do with the inability to resolve some of these problems, has to do with the way the system after World War II was structured and then was not adapted as the world began to change in the last 20 years or so. Biakalai, welcome. Um, my name is Milady and I, I was listening to what you said about leadership um, could bring about change. And my question is about Cuba. I know that Timor relies on the Cubans for most of your health and education sector, and there's bilateral agreements. Um, given that Cuba hasn't held democratic elections in 50 years, I was wondering if how you see your leadership in helping bring that about. Obrigada. Well, I do not uh, necessarily agree with the Cuban political system. I do not aspire to be president for the next 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I will not attempt to change the constitution like Hugo Chavez has just done uh, to uh, enable me to run <laughs> indefinitely. So politically speaking, I do not uh, share, uh, agree with the Cuban political system. On economics, I told my Cuban friends when I was there recently in uh, September, if in my own country we, <laughs> we were, the state were already to start running also restaurants, it would be a total disaster. We, can, we cannot run some of the ministries, let alone taking care of the restaurants. Uh, this is only to illustrate you know, the absurdity in 21st century of a state wanting to manage also uh, restaurants and I don't know. So politically, uh, I don't agree with that. Uh, economically, I think, you know, the Cubans should look at the Vietnam uh, Chinese uh, example. Uh, they put, uh, but I had long conversation with Raul Castro. Actually, not real conversation. He talks to you. You don't talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> So it was not exactly a conversation. <laughs> At the end of his, uh, his speech to me, I told him, Raul, I told him, Raul, speaking in Spanish, when I'm next in Washington and see my American friends, I will tell them one thing. 
you talk as much as your brother Fidel. <laughs> Two, if they expect you to die soon, you probably are not going to die soon. He's incredible energy. <laughs> He's 70 something, he looks like someone 60. And the Cuban, uh, but Cuba is uh, ripe for change. The situation, in my view, is just unsustainable. That, again, is when uh, this administration came in such a right time to uh, initiate some serious dialogue. And Raul told me, because we talk about uh, their relations, and uh, Raul told me, we are ready to talk with Americans, equal level, uh, but, uh, w and without intermediaries. And I think, in, in spite of all this country has done to Cuba, there is still incredible uh, flirtation with anything U.S. You don't find anti, apart from the political rhetoric, you know, the speeches, the whatever is organized time to time, no anti-U.S. animosity. There are no two countries that can be closer than these two, U.S. and Cuba. But obviously the situation in Cuba has to change, and it can change. And the, in my view, in a very frank way, as I look at Cuba and look at the possibility of the U.S. lifting sanctions, relaxing travel controls, I just wonder myself, the, how will the Cubans be able to control the situation? He will achieve more in inducing changes in Cuba by lifting sanctions, allowing free flow of contacts than um, what you've been doing for the last 50 years. Someone, I think, uh, my, uh, uh, someone told me the other day, made a brilliant uh, uh, point that the uh, President Barack Obama is younger than the policies of sanctions of, on, U, on Cuba. <laughs> the policy of sanctions, 50 years. Barack Obama is 40-something, 47. So it is time. And uh, even if this might sound, uh, you know, unpalatable for many, uh, whether you deal with Cuba or with Burma, because, you know, when you advocate sanctions, sanctions, punishment for so many years, and then suddenly you have to change. Uh, it, uh, so, but I don't see any other uh, way. Cuba will change. It's inevitable. And better than it is a carefully managed change with U.S. support in cooperation with the current regime. And uh, then... Uh, uh, unpredictable uh, sudden uh, changes that may occur. The Cuban, and Fidel Castro is not uh, Saddam Hussein, Fidel Castro is not uh, uh, some of the dictators uh, that we know in history. No, he's genuinely respected, admired by his people. They have achieved a lot for their people. And one of the greatest achievements for them is the Cuban sense of dignity, of pride. And that is no money can uh, pay for that, buy that. So uh, that's, and that is very, very important, you know. They are very proud people, very dignified. And uh, so I know, I think, uh, we've met before and uh, I know where you're from. <laughs> Kumar from Amnesty International. Uh, President, um, uh, you mentioned in your opening remarks about the status of your country as fragile. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit about uh, what major issues that make you, you feel that country is still fragile? My second question is um, you have enormous credibility and, uh, and uh, moral authority to speak about abuses around the world, you know, especially in conflict zones, because you understand it and you have gone through like Nelson Mandela did it. And I wonder whether you have thought of uh, using your, 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 that power that you have, which is very unique uh, for, for world leaders, uh, to use it in dealing with other countries. Thanks. Only thing I can say is that uh, the use uh, of uh, force as always the first temptation, the first option. 
whether in a cross-border interstate conflict or within uh, the countries uh, is the worst uh, option. I'm not a pacifist like uh, the Dalai Lama. You ask the Dalai Lama, he'll say no and no and no. If you ask the Dalai Lama, but then how are you going to resolve the Osama bin Laden threat? He probably will tell you, pray and pray and pray. <laughs> well, uh, so I don't share completely His Holiness' uh, uh, views on certain uh, situations. Sometimes history has shown us that the use of force is necessary, but it must be always the last resort. And in my experience is even some of the most intractable individuals, you can change them. If you're just patient enough, humble enough to listen, listen and listen, and then maybe uh, start talking with them back to find ways to... Uh, situations like in Sri Lanka, uh, for just what is happening now, uh, the government seem to be having military upper hand, but do they really feel that, believe that they can crush the Tamil to the bitter end and they will not resurrect again? They are still four million people in the country. Four million people is a lot. A people that is profoundly wounded in their body and soul and mind, humiliated, they will fight back and with viciousness. And that's happened in few other situations. So even when we are, I always said way back in 99 when I back, went back to my country in a speech in a place called Sami, I said, in victory, let us be magnanimous. I was referring to those East Timorese who are on the other side, who sided with Indonesia. Never rub the wounds of anyone who uh, feel that he or she had lost try to make him or she feel that he or she too won. And that's what we have tried to do with the Indonesian side. And that's why partly today we have the best relationship with them. We don't make the Indonesian feel that they lost. In practical reality, they won. They got rid of a problem that costs a lot of money, but mostly rocks, according to B.J. Habibi. <laughs> now, bustling trade one way. You know, we buy everything from Indonesia. They buy very little from us because we don't have much to sell uh, anyway. I dealt with my own people, you know, those who shot me. You cannot have a you know, more extreme example than that, that I'm prepared to go anywhere, to meet with anyone, to engage in dialogue. I completely oppose in 2007, 2006, on the use of force against those rebel elements. There were more than 700. I managed to neutralize almost all of them. Mr. Alfredo Reynaldo, his strategy, he had only a group of him and a bit more than 20 armed. His strategy was to have the 700 who abandoned the army to be his ready instant army. That's what he failed. And that's why he was so angry. And, uh, but even with him, I oppose the use of force to the point where a judge in our court, uh, not a Timorese judge, one of the foreign judges working there, had uh, issued a statement criticizing the president for interfering with justice. No, I was not interfering with justice. An arrest warrant was uh, issued by the court. UNPOL, ISF, interest was supposed to then enforce the arrest warrant. And how are you going to enforce it? You go with helicopters with tanks, with troops, and shoot at each other. There will be killings on the other side, dead on the other side, and on the other side of the UN and the ISF. If I'm able to engage them in dialogue to effect this arrest warrant without firing a shot, why not? So that's what I attempted. And uh, I went, saw the, he and the, his men many times. But uh, again, I was dealing with a psychopath and uh, he, too bad for him, he didn't seize the opportunity. So that I offer him to surrender with dignity and to be treated as a military man with dignity. 
because I didn't see the problems completely with, on his side. We political leaders fail. Political leaders take credit and take responsibility when things don't go well. And uh, we fail. And because of that, that I said no. Uh, these people, you know, these, these soldiers, these officers who are disgruntled, unhappy, they didn't wake up one morning and decide to defect for no reason. No, something must have gone wrong on our side. And so that's why I, uh, I engaged in a dialogue with them. But unfortunately, February 11, I was shot out of the blue. The country went into a state of shock because they knew what I was doing. Uh, they were very upset. And that's why I don't like to compare myself with Mahatma Gandhi because, you know, he is a saint, I'm a sinner. But uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, you know, when he went on hunger strike over the ethnic religious violence in India at the time, almost that dead, violence stopped. Well, when I was shot, violence stopped. Even the gangs stopped till today. It's still fragile because, well, all the institutions are fragile. Still fragile because the history of violence is recent. It's only happened on just over these years. And uh, that's why I say, you know, we have to be very careful with what we even say. Some of the more incendiary speeches by some of our leaders in 2006 contributed to the destabilization of the country. Some of the violence, uh, well, the, the genocide that happened in the Balkans or in Rwanda it started with speeches by demagogues. And these were situations also very fragile of uh, people's emotions you know, in that chaotic transition at the time in the Balkans. If you don't you know, careful with what you say, you inflame passions and destabilize. That's why in Timor, be very careful. And some of my compatriots are not careful when they talk. They don't measure. And then create suspicion, uh, anger, further suspicion, and then so that's why I keep saying, you know, fragile and be very careful. My advice to leaders who face internal insurgencies, situations, rethink, step back, and try to talk. Because after all, they are your people. They are not aliens. The Tamils are part of Sri Lanka. Talk to them. I would tell Wo Jintao, talk, call your brother. The Dalai Lama is a wonderful human being. He is the only one who can deliver a uh, peaceful uh, Tibet for China. Uh, he's a wonderful human being. But the Chinese are utterly suspicious. Of they don't believe him, trust him at all. Well, that's understandable. But that's not an insurmountable problem. It can be uh, uh, if all sides cool down and uh, start talking, they might resolve it in the long term. Mr. President, thank you very much. We have run out of time. Um, please, right.